I am so glad you're here, and I'm excited about today. I know that it's opening day of the NFL, and the Seahawks are going to play the Packers, and it's going to be an incredible game, but I'm excited about something way uh, bigger than that. So I'm excited about the journey we're going to enter into today, going for about 11, 12, 13 weeks. I don't remember how long we're going, but uh, we're going we're gonna to find our way to freedom and so I'm excited about the spiritual outcomes, the real life outcomes that you're on the journey to starting today that I believe are gonna absolutely come uh, full force in you as you take this journey with us. So I hope that you will, uh, man, lock in for a, a, an 11-week fall commitment to be a part of this journey with me, okay? Uh, if you have to miss a, a Sunday, then watch it online or grab it online later. Uh, but this is going to be a... a a long conversation uh, that each conversation is super important and it builds into the freedom that we have. So I want you to take a Bible right now and turn to John chapter eight. John chapter eight in uh, the Bible in the pew rack in front of you, it's page 746, or if you have your own Bible or your smartphone or whatever. And uh, while you're turning there, I wanna say happy birthday to our Centralia campus, which turns one year old today. They have finished their first year and... It's been a great, yeah, that's awesome. They have, uh, I think they've baptized about 18 folks and um, added new members to the church and the youth ministry's growing and just so many good things happening there. And uh, I'm really proud of that team and thanks for being a part of that. So John chapter eight. Now, uh, this is gonna be an interesting conversation and one that maybe you've never had before. It's certainly a body of teaching that I have never done before uh, in this way. So uh, I have been studying my head off, and my convictions are running deep on the subject matter, and so I ask you to open your heart and mind and see what God might say to you. Here's the big idea, is that Jesus came to set us free. Our theme verse for the whole series is John 8, 36, which says, those whom the Son sets free are free indeed. And here's my casual observation, and we have researchers all over the country who can verify this observation. This is borne out in research, and of course, I think your own heart will bear this out as well, that the predominant uh, uh, reality for Christians is we're not living in freedom. We still have emotional hangups and hurts. We still have bitterness. We have levels of anxiety and emotional disorders. We have marriages that aren't succeeding. We have uh, habitual sin. We have battles with, with uh, controlling our thought life. Um, Christians are not living free, certainly not to the degree of freedom that Jesus describes for us. And I believe that in God's heart, he is saying, now is a time where I want you to find your way to the freedom that I purchased for you, and I want you to find the secrets. Listen, because here's the deal. There are, there are truths about how to walk in that freedom and how to experience that freedom that if you ignore, you simply won't find your way to freedom. So, uh, man, we're gonna, we're gonna take a walk together through a lot of fascinating stuff, and I want you just to open your heart and your mind to what God would say to you. And if you have friends, family members, enemies, neighbors, who uh, find themselves imprisoned, enslaved by whatever, this is a great time to get them here to walk this journey with you. John chapter eight, let's start in verse 31 and we're gonna read verse 31 to verse 38, or verse 36 rather, and uh, then we're gonna start our conversations. Here we go. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be free? Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone, listen to this language, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, here's our key verse, so if the Son sets you free, you will be truly free. You'll be free indeed. You'll be free in fact. You will be free. 
If you read, continuing on there, he goes into a discussion with these Jews about whether God is their father or whether the devil is their father. And they believe that God is their father and they don't understand Jesus. And in fact, they want to kill Jesus. And Jesus is saying that here's the difference, slaves and sons. And he says, I want you to know that if you're a slave, if you're living enslaved, you're not a son, but a son, and you're not a part of the family rather, but a son is part of the family forever. And not only do sons receive freedom from their father, they also can give freedom through their father, which Jesus then says, so if the son sets you free, you're really free. I wanna give you, uh, so here we're starting into this long conversation and, and these two certainties about the battle. Let me tell you this. Uh, you were born not into a game of shoots and ladders. You weren't born into candy land. You weren't born into a playground. You were born into Syria. You were born into uh, the Middle East, talking about war zones, okay? Spiritually, you were born into a war zone. Now, here in America, we have never, since the Civil War, experienced war as a part of our daily life. But there are places in the world where they are living in the realities of war every day. They're learning how to love husbands and wives, how to have, uh, how, how to have a love life, how to have children, how to have a future, how to have a, a life in the middle of a context of war as an ever-present reality. And the truth about you and I is we were born into a, uh, a cosmic reality that is at war. And the problem is that we tend to view the world as our playground. And we don't know we're at war. And so we become casualties of war really easily. Two certainties about this uh, journey to freedom, this battle for freedom, that I want you to write down. And man, if you're not normally a note taker, we're gonna be so thick in content that you're gonna say, man, I wish I'd written that down. And I just encourage you to take notes. Uh, two certainties I want you to get in your mind. This is kind of foundational to the conversation. Certainty number one is that the warfare, the battle goes on on three fronts. The world, the self, and the devil. This battle you're in for freedom, this battle you're in to stop being an introvert who's not just an introvert, but an introvert, a dysfunctional introvert, like you are enslaved and afraid of people. Or a person who's got anger and you've just got rage inside of you and you don't know why you're so angry and you're just living with that, okay? Your journey to freedom over your habitual sin, these areas that just keep grabbing you and keep grabbing you and keep grabbing you. Your journey to freedom has a battle on three fronts, the world, the self, and the devil. We live in a world that has actually a spirit of the age. For example, Plato said, uh, you write the books, let me write the music, and I'll change the world. We live in a world that through the music, through the arts, through media and movies and television, through books, through uh, the culture, there is a spirit of the age that is constantly trying to shape you, push you, uh, design how you think, how you feel, what you value. And that spirit of the age is an enemy of yours. There's the self where you were born, listen, you say, well, I think people are basically good. Here's the truth that the Bible says about human beings. Every human being is born already broken. The language is born in iniquity. In iniquity did my mother conceive me, right? Not that she had a sinful act that conceived me, but the iniquity of my father is passed through the blood of my mother in my birth, and I am born with iniquity. The Bible has three words for sin. There's sin, transgression, and iniquity. Iniquity means bentness or perversity. And I'm born that way. I am born already bent toward sin, already perverse in my soul. So 
uh, I'm on the journey to redemption from the beginning. And boy, what we see in our culture in the spirit of the age is that perversity run wild, that bentness running wild. And what, so we gotta fight the spirit of that age, we have to fight the self. We have tendencies and we have uh, wounds. We have scar tissue. We have baggage. We have betrayals. We have shrapnel from our own sin and from the sin of others. So we've got this battle with the self to, inside us where God is calling us to disciple the self. That's why discipleship is so important, to discipline the self so that the self doesn't just think what it thinks and feels what it feels and runs off with its emotions. It is, it is led by God through my discipleship so that the self, I win the battle with the self because you know the self is one of our biggest enemies. And then the devil. You are gonna fight your battle for freedom on all three of those fronts. And so throughout this series, we'll keep talking about the spirit of the age, the battle of the self or the flesh, and the battle of the demonic. Now, the second certainty I want you to get as the foundation of this conversation is that Jesus wins the first battle for us and you don't even participate. And after that, you must participate in every future victory. You have to fight. Now you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. I'm not sure that's true. Because a lot of us, this is how we functionally practice our faith, is we sit in our recliner waiting for Jesus to set us free from everything. And we don't really fight our own sin nature, and we don't really fight the spirit of the age, and we certainly aren't engaged in demonic activity because we're not even sure that's real. And so we're just waiting for Jesus to fix everything for us, and then we'll walk in the freedom he fixes for us. But Jesus isn't going to do that for you. Sometimes God delivers an addict from their addiction in a moment. Sometimes uh, a person is stuck in a habitual sin and God delivers them in a moment. But most of the time, he says, come with me and let's kick this addiction's butt together. Come with me and let's defeat this habitual sin together. Why? Because if he just delivered you, you would never understand what got you there in the first place and you'll go back and repeat what you did. What you need is transformation. And he walks us through that. I say, well, I'm, not, I'm still not sure I'm buying what you're selling. Well, let me give you the biblical model. In the Old Testament, we have the nation of Israel. Their history is recorded for us. And it is, if you read the book of Hebrews, it says that Israel is the model of God's work in our lives. And we see all of that happened for our instruction. And God is telling his story through the story of humanity. And he started at creation, and he's telling the story now. One of the, things, one of the reasons I believe that the coming of the Lord could be imminent is because the story's told. But here's the story. He takes Israel, who he chooses as his own, and when you read your Old Testament, if you, here's a hermeneutical principle for you, a Bible interpretation principle for you. When you read about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, God treats Israel as one man. So if there's sin in the camp, the whole camp is sinned because it's like sin within you. So Israel represents you. And when you watch Israel's journey of faith with God as a nation, that's your journey of faith as an individual. And what happens is uh, God delivers them from slavery. If you haven't read the book, you saw the movie, so uh, you should read the book. But God delivers them from slavery in Egypt. They are slaves for 400 years. And then he delivers them. And they go into the promised land. And then because of a bunch of uh, stupidity on their parts, they hang around in the, in the desert for 40 years. But now it's time to go into the promised land. The promised land is where God says to them, everywhere your foot goes is your ground. I'm giving it to you. It's a gift from God. This is the promised land. That's a picture of you and I, after Christ, entering into our freedom, culminating in when we all go to heaven at the return of Christ and we live where there's no more disease, no more crying, no more sin. I mean, it's awesome. Until then, we're entering this promised land of being free in Christ in the middle of a war zone. 
When they come out of, the, uh, out of the desert into the promised land, what's the first city they come to? For those of you who uh, know your Bible, they come to Jericho. Now, when they come to Jericho, God says, hey, relax, I got this one. He doesn't really. He tells them, I want you just to worship me. So they literally uh, walk laps around the city worshiping God. And on the seventh day, God just opens a can and whoops them, okay? If you're not from the South, you might not know what that means, but, uh, <laughs> but he, just, he just destroys the city. And the walls crumble, and he destroys the city, and then here's what God says. That one's on me, boys. In fact, that victory I won for you, and I don't want you to ever rebuild this city. You remember this about Jericho? God said, if whoever rebuilds this city will lay its foundations at the cost of the life of their firstborn son. And whoever finishes the city hanging the gates will do so at the cost of the life of their youngest son. I do not want this city rebuilt. Later on in history, some moron rebuilds a city, and sure enough, at the cost of his, of his firstborn son and at the cost of his youngest son. God says, I don't want that city rebuilt. Here's the picture. Listen to this. This is so stinking good, man. Christ ushers you into right relationship with God by virtue of his death on the cross. Listen, he won the battle for you. There is nothing, nothing you contribute to that. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, hangs on the cross, and purchases your freedom. God now says, man, I love you. I love you the way I love Jesus because he appropriated himself to you and now I'm gonna treat you the way I treat Jesus because he purchased it for you. And so this battle of a relationship between you and God is won and you did nothing to get it. Now here's the thing, God doesn't want you to ever rebuild on that. Don't start thinking, well, because I'm a good moral person, because I practice holiness better than most people, uh, God likes me a little bit more, or God likes me because I'm a good Christian. If you do that, you're rebuilding on what he already won for you. You are in right relationship with God for one reason. Jesus died for you. Receive that, accept that, and never try to justify yourself before God on any other basis than the victory Jesus gave to you. Now, Jesus says, now, I you don't ever have to worry about whether God likes you or not anymore. You don't ever have to worry about whether God forgives you anymore. A lot of you still do. You wallow in guilt and shame and you say, well, God can't really like me because, man, I can't get my act together. Listen, you never have to win that victory again. Jesus won it for you. Now he wants to walk with you to freedom. Freedom from the self. Freedom from the spirit of the age. Freedom from the enemy so that you actually live a free life. And that means you're gonna have to kick some butt yourself. You're gonna have to win some battles. And Jesus says, I'm gonna fill you with my power and my presence, and I promise you that victory is yours. And armor up, dude, because you're gonna have to fight. You need a sword in your hand, you need a shield, you need armor, you need to realize you're in a fight, and you need to participate with me in all of your future victories, because that one I gave you, the rest of them we're gonna earn together. This is, this, man, this is gold. So what we're gonna talk about for these weeks is how do we walk with Jesus to the victory, fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat when necessary to get the freedom that Jesus says is ours. Too many of us are living not free. And the problem is, we think that this is as good as it gets, so we settle in. I hear people say, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. I'm, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And we lower the bar of our expectations about what transformation looks like. And so we're still mean, cantankerous people, and we're not surprised that Jesus isn't helping us become gracious, kind, loving people. Or we're still battling that habitual sin that's been a part of our life since we were eight or nine or 10 years old and I can't find freedom from it. And I guess, well, the good thing Jesus did is he bought me an eternal ticket to heaven so I just need to tie a knot in the rope and hold on till I get to heaven and until then I'm gonna live a tortured, non-free life. No, that is not the gospel. 
Though the truth will set you free, and those whom the Son sets free are really free. You can be free. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that, that we do not uh, fall subject to the devil's schemes because we're not unaware. We're not unaware of the devil's schemes. Well, in fact, most of us are unaware. And so uh, here's what we're going to do today. Three things. The reality of the demonic, the relationship between the demonic and a Christian, and how we find our freedom. Now, some of you, you might start squirming in your seat and go, man, I'm not even going to What? Stick with me here. Most Christians do not find freedom because they don't believe they can be in bondage. Christians can absolutely be in bondage. And Jesus wants to set you free. And you can be in bondage to the spirit of the age. You can be seduced and intoxicated by the spirit of the age. You can be in bondage to the self. You can be in bondage to the demonic. God wants to set you free. You're gonna have to fight for your freedom with Jesus in you, and you're going to be free by the power of Christ in you. Absolutely. So let's talk about this. First of all, demons are real. Uh, 80 times in the New Testament, the demonic is revealed. God pulls back the curtain and lets us see the activity of the demonic, 80 times. 61 times in the four gospels, as you read the life of Jesus, you watch Jesus interact with the demonic. And we learn a lot about it from those encounters. Let me just give you a small sample. In, in, uh, in Mark chapter five, there is a guy, this is one of my favorite stories. There is a guy who is demon possessed and he lives among the tombs of a region called the region of the Gadarenes. And he is, this, this guy is tormented. He is so demon-filled that he has like uh, superhuman strength. They have tried, the whole city's afraid of him. They have tried to bind him with ropes. They have tried to bind him with chains. They have tried to restrain him, but he breaks right through them. And he, the whole city's scared of him. And he, this poor guy, cuts himself with rocks. He is a tormented person. And Jesus shows up. And Jesus sets him free. Jesus says to the man, he says, and he's speaking to the demon inside the man, what is your name? And the demon says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion is a, is a military term, and in that era of history, a legion was a group of 6,826 soldiers. My name is Legion, for we are many. Does that mean the guy has 6,826 demons inside of him? I'm not exactly sure. But that's what the guy says. It's what the, it's what the, the Spirit says. And Jesus then, uh, they say to Jesus, if you're gonna send us out of this man, send us into that herd of pigs or a flock of, I don't know what a group of pigs are called, but whatever they are, send us into that. And so Jesus says, go. And they enter into a huge, uh, we'll call it a herd, pigs, and they run off a cliff into the lake and they all drown. As an example about this, uh, later as Jesus on the night he's betrayed, uh, when, when they come to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out a sword to fight. And Jesus says, put away your sword. Do you not know, this is what he says, do you not know that I could ask my father and he would dispatch to me 12 legions of angels who would be at my disposal if I wanted. 12 legions, 12 of 6,826, over 80,000 angels, warrior angels could be dispatched to Jesus' disposal if he wanted it right there in that moment. How many angels are there? How many demons are there? I don't know. We know that a third of the angels uh, rebelled against God with Satan and they were rejected from heaven and they became demons. And so Jesus has at least 12 legions at his disposal. I don't know how many there are, but they're real. In Matthew chapter 17, there's a boy who has uh, seizures and he keeps falling as a demon uh, overcomes him and he falls and he, and he has a seizure and he goes into the fire or he goes into the river. 
and the dad is begging for his son to be healed and delivered, and the disciples can't do it. Jesus walks up and casts out a demon and heals the boy. And they say, why couldn't we do that? He said, well, this one comes out by prayer and fasting. In uh, Matthew 8, it says Jesus drove out evil spirits and healed all the sick. In Mark 3, it says that Jesus chose 12, we call them the disciples, and he appointed them that they might, listen to this, be with him, proclaim, speak for him, and have authority over demons. Now, right now, I don't know what your level of thought or anxiety is, but I want to make something clear. Uh, C.S. Lewis says that there's two kinds of Christians that the devil loves. He loves the kind of Christian that says, I don't even believe demons are real. That's like, I don't even, uh, what? Nah. And he loves the kind who find a devil under every corner. We're not given to either of those extremes. Here's the scriptures testify that the demonic is real. You and I entered into a world that's not a three-dimensional world. It's at least a four-dimensional world. And there are spirits. And sometimes the New Testament peels back the sheets and lets us see behind the curtain the reality of this spiritual world that we are in. They are real. And Jesus is the first person in history to have authority over them. And he gives that authority to us. So, should you be afraid of the demonic? No, you should not. But you should be aware. There is an engagement. There is an engagement that happens. So, uh, man, the demonic is real. Jack Hayford, I, big hero of mine. Jack Hayford says, here's the problem. You can't cast out the self and you can't disciple a demon. So as we go on this journey to our freedom... We have to realize what we're fighting, who we're fighting. Am I fighting the spirit of the age? Am I fighting the self? Am I fighting the demonic? And to fight appropriately, we are aware. That's 2 Corinthians 11. We are aware of the, the, the devil's schemes. So, first of all, number one, there really are demons. Do we need deliverance or do we need discipleship? And the answer is yes. We need deliverance and we need discipleship. And Jesus gives it all to us. The second thing I want you to understand is that uh, the enemy can work inside believers. The enemy can work inside believers. If, you, if you're at John 8 still and you turn one page, you're in John 10. And in John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And in the context of that, he's talking about he is the good shepherd, and he lays down his life for the sheep. The other people are hired hands, but I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep, and he said, I protect the sheep. The sheep hear my voice. They know me, and there's a relationship. He says, the enemy comes not through the gate. He comes in some other way, and he says, the one who climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. And so what he's wanting you to know is that there is an enemy who's going to climb in some other way into your world. He can't come through the gate because Jesus is the gate. But he's going to climb in some other way, an open window, an open door. And he's going to climb in because he wants to steal from you, rob from you, kill you, destroy you. In Joel chapter 2 verse 9, uh, there's a verse that says they run on the city, they walk on the wall. If you're a Christian as old as me, you remember a stupid a uh, minor key song we used to sing with that line, they rush on the city, they run on the wall, great is the army that carries, right? It's ridiculous that we ever sang that song because Joel chapter two is about the cursing that falls on the people of God in rebellion against God. And Joel 2, 9 says, they rush on the city, they run on the wall, they climb in through the windows and they rob like a thief. This is what can happen to us. Let me read you Ephesians chapter six. Just to give you a sample, you can turn there if you like, but Ephesians 6, verse 10, listen to this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I'm not talking to you about being strong in your own strength. Our victory will come not because we're superhuman strong. It'll come because we're strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Remember 2 Corinthians 2? We are not unaware of the devil's schemes. So we take those on. 
Our struggle, listen to this, if you think your enemy is a human being, if there's ever a problem in your life and you think that your enemy is a person you can name, that's always not true. Here's what it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Your enemy is always the spirit of the age, the self, or the devil. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. And it goes on through a discussion about the armor of God where you can have victory in this warfare. Right now, uh, you know, the truth is that you can be, a Christian can be under the influence. There are, there are two words for demon possession in the New Testament, Greek words. One of them is the word, uh, it's about ownership and possession. The other is to uh, take control of or to, or to have power over. So here's the truth about demonic activity and Christians. Uh, you can be under the influence. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? Absolutely not. But can a Christian be under the influence of demonic efforts? Absolutely. If you've ever been drunk, people who get drunk say, I had too much to drink and I did something and I'm so embarrassed by that. And it's just not me. I, was so, I mean, that's not me. I would never do that. But I did it because I was drunk. I was high. I was stoned. I was, I was on drugs and I did stuff. And some of you, you know, you see those funny uh, videos on Facebook where someone's coming home from the dentist and they've had all the gas and stuff and they're saying crazy stuff. Uh, you know, that's not me. We have an ESPN sports reporter who, who got drunk and woke up in a stranger's house, naked, on the couch. And ESPN is trying to figure out what to do with this reporter because he's saying, that's not me, you know, that never happens. I just, I got drunk and I wasn't myself. Right now, your house, you're not home, you're here. And if your house is not locked, and mine never is. I guess that was dumb, tell the whole world my, <laughs> my house is never locked. Uh, if your house is unlocked, if a window is open, a thief can come in through an open door or an open window. Does that thief own your home? No, he does not. But right now, he's in there and he can do pretty much whatever he wants in there. What we're gonna learn over this series is that as we face, as we battle the self and the spirit of the age and the devil, there are times when we open windows in our life and we allow the, the demonic to come in and have his way with us because we left a window open. Let me just tell you as an example, guys, if you're trapped in pornography, you're opening a window where, where the spiritual spirit of the age and the demonic can come in and just have his way with you, man. When we don't forgive, when we hold on to bitterness, man, that's one of the biggest ones the New Testament talks to us about. When you refuse to forgive, and I will not forgive that person to the day I die, and you have bitterness in your heart. It's an open window, it's an open door. So, uh, can a Christian be demon possessed? Absolutely not. Can he have an enemy working inside? Yes, absolutely can. Now, the third thing I want you to know, here's the good news, okay? The good news is, hey, this isn't a bad habit. You can't just say, well, I'm Irish and redheaded, so I'm gonna always have a temper. That's just what I gotta live with. You don't have a habitual sin. Well, that comes because of something that was done to me when I was a kid, and I'll never be free from that. You don't have a bad habit. You don't have, uh, you are in bondage. Listen, man, if you could have been free on your own, you would have been, and you're not, and you're living your life in bondage. And what happens is you settle in and get comfortable there. And you think, well, this is as good as life gets till I get to heaven. No, life can be way better. Jesus says, I will set you free. So here's the good news. If it was just a bad habit, if it was just an addiction passed on through your family, if it was just a family curse, if it was just uh, the condition of some uh, horrible thing that happened to you, then you'd have to live with it for the rest of your life. But it's not that, it's bondage. And that means if it's bondage, I happen to know someone who sets people free from bondage. 
And if it's bondage, you can be set free. And that's the third point I want you to know is that Jesus really does cast this stuff out. Jesus really does give you victory. Jesus really will walk with you to freedom. He absolutely will. That's his promise. In, uh, in Lamentations uh, chapter two and in chapter 14, there's this language of Israel being shocked because the enemy has come in through the window and taken over Jerusalem and they never thought it could happen to them. And that is the state of many of us. I never thought I could be uh, enslaved because I am a Christian. And unfortunately, Christians are living in slavery a lot. Let me read you a passage from Luke and then I'm gonna walk you through our close today. In Luke 10, starting in verse 17, uh, I'm gonna read to you starting in verse 17, but in Luke 10, Jesus has these group of disciples. They're now about 72 of them, and he sends them out two by two to go and proclaim uh, the good news of Jesus, the repentance of sins, to these Jewish cities. And uh, in verse 17, it says this, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They are like blown away at this. Jesus says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to everyone and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Does that mean we're gonna handle snakes and play with scorpions and God's gonna protect us? No, those are metaphors, those are imageries. The enemy came in the garden and deceived Eve and Adam. How did he do that? He was a serpent. I've given you authority over serpents and scorpions. No matter what the enemy tries to do to deceive you, I've given you authority over that and you can overcome all the power of the evil one. That's available to you. Then he says, However, do not rejoice that spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Listen, religion won't set you free. Those Jews in John 8 that uh, Jesus was talking to says you're slaves. They go, we can't be slaves. We're children of Abraham. They were slaves because they were hung up in religion. They couldn't even see the truth because they're so wrapped up in religion. Religion is an incredible place to hide. You can be more, religion is dangerous. Religion will not set you free. Churches won't set you free. Preachers will not set you free. Jesus will set you free. And so we keep our eyes on Christ and we have a relationship with Jesus. That's how we walk to freedom. So do not rejoice that demons are subject to your name. Certainly don't be afraid. Armor up, dude, walk with Jesus and win the victories that are yours because of Christ. Walk in the freedom he paid for for you and defeat the enemy because you have authority to defeat, tread on snakes, scorpions, whatever he's up to, you can overcome in Christ. So remember Mark 5, the dude in the tombs who's got chains and ropes and he's tortured soul and he's cutting himself and nobody can help him find freedom and he's got a legion of demons in him? It says when Jesus showed up, this man ran to Jesus and worshiped him. And there's no devil in the world that can stop you from doing that. He ran to Jesus and worshiped. Now, if you're looking in the NIV at Mark 5, it says he ran to Jesus and fell at his feet. But that's what the Greek uh, idea of worship is. It's not songs. It is to come to Jesus and kneel at his feet. You are king, I am servant. I worship you. And in his worshiping of Jesus, he is set free. And now, uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the whole episode, do you remember what happened? G he says to Jesus, I wanna go with you. And Jesus says, no, go back to your people. Go back to your oikos. Go back to your people that God has put in your life and tell them everything God has done for you. It's time for you to get on your mission and, and work this out. Today, your journey to freedom begins. Some of you are sitting here and you've been going through as I've been talking. Man, I feel enslaved to that emotion. I feel enslaved to that sin habit. I feel enslaved to that broken relationship, to that bitterness, to that unforgiveness. I feel enslaved to this personality type of mind. I feel enslaved to anxiety and fear. I feel enslaved. It's not a habit, it is a bondage. And you can be free if you come to Jesus 
and worship him. And so this is day one of your new life. Often in our church, I will invite you to experience God's work in you from your pew where you sit and without even having to identify yourself in front of anybody else. I have, however, sensed uh, a conviction from the Lord that today that is not to be the case. In fact, through this series, that is not to be the case. And I'm gonna ask you, do you wanna be free? And if you wanna be free, the first journey is to walk to the front of this room and get on your knees and worship Jesus. It is not about me. It's not about the church. You say, well, people in here are gonna think I'm a beating my wife. People in here are gonna think I'm trapped in a sin. People around here are gonna think that I'm, a, that I'm an adulterer. No, people in the room are gonna go, way to go, man. Way to go. Get free. So our worship team's gonna come out. I'm gonna pray for you. And then I'm gonna invite you to start your journey to freedom today by simply coming to Jesus and bowing and worshiping him. Now, uh, we have prayer volunteers that are on the job. They've been praying about this moment for a few weeks. And they are prepared to pray for you. It occurs to me, in my journey of faith, there have been times where I desperately wanted someone to pray over me. And there were times where I desperately wanted to be left alone so I could encounter Jesus because my heart's on fire to have a conversation with him. And we want to accommodate either one of those for you. So if you say, man, I just want to come and worship Jesus and fall at his feet, and I want Jesus to set me free, I want to talk to Jesus, then I want you to stay between the two sets of steps in the middle here. And if you say, no, I'd like somebody to pray for me. I'd really like someone to just put a hand on my shoulder or pray over me and help me win this victory. Then I want you to stay outside the steps on either side, and prayer volunteers will know that if you're over there, then you would like someone to pray with you, and they'll pray with you. It's time for you to desire freedom enough to be courageous and come to Jesus. Let me pray for you, and then I'm gonna invite you simply to come. Balcony, floor, it doesn't matter. Come, and we're gonna worship in music while you come and worship Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful for the freedom that is ours through the person and work of Jesus. Christ died for us took care of the penalty of our sin. We are eternally free from the penalty of our sin because of the work of Christ. And now, Jesus, you invite us to walk with you into whole new levels of freedom. Freedom from the spirit of the age and freedom from the hangups of our flesh and freedom from the work of the enemy. And you can set us free as we walk with you and fight and overcome. So Lord, we wanna start today by just getting on our knees and declaring, we worship you, Lord. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters to have courage to come forward, to to take this action as their first step of walking in the freedom you gave them. Lord, make this a defining moment, I pray, and meet us as we kneel before you. I ask it in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Would you all stand? If you need to come, you come. Sing this song with us. And if you wanna come, you come either between the two steps or on the outside, kneel and worship the Lord, and let's watch freedom come.